Well, thank you all for coming. I think we will get underway. We have all our panelists. And we, uh, uh, the, the Dean Schrober has been very kind to introduce this session, so I will give it to him and then take it from him when he's finished. He's dean of the, for those of you who don't know, dean of the New School for Social Research. We appreciate your coming. We know you have another event. Uh, so we doubly appreciate your coming. Thanks. Thanks so much. So um, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Michael Schober. I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome you to the university, to uh, the New School for Social Research, to the Economics Department, and the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, uh, a, a center and a, and a university that focus on questions that others don't always ask and, that, and takes approaches that don't take for granted all received wisdom. So um, I think this is a great place to ask that kind of thing. Tonight I'm pleased that we're focusing on a really important discussion about the broad, long-lasting effects of recession, and of course of this recession that we're currently in. Um, it may seem that this is a topic that, er that econo economists should understand well already and deeply, and yet there is much more to talk about. And uh, tonight's panel is, is, I think, an exciting opportunity to bring together some folks and have a spirited discussion. Um, a few words on this event. It's being hosted by the Department of Economics' the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, or SEPA. Um, we are very proud to have Professor Jeff Madrick as a senior fellow here at SEPA, and um, we look forward to his longer-term work. I understand today's panel discussion is sort of a starting point for longer-term work on the purpose of government project. Uh, beyond his work at the New School, Professor Madrick is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He is the editor of Challenge Magazine and a visiting professor of humanities at the Cooper Union. He's also a fellow of the World Policy Institute and the Century Foundation, and he's a member of the board of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He's published numerous scholarly articles and books, the most recent of which is Age of Greed, The Triumph of Finance and the Decline of America, 1970 to the Present. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Jeff Madrick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Schreiber. I did not expect that long introduction, and I don't have a commensurate introduction for each of our panelists, all of whom deserve longer introductions than that. Uh, and it, but thank you for coming and, and launching us. This is part of a bigger program that we're starting, partly in conjunction with the Roosevelt Institute, where I'm also a senior fellow, a project on the purpose of government. We think uh, the narrative has been anti-government for so long now. There are those of you in the audience who have no recollection of a different time, I can tell just by looking at you. Once upon a time, America actually had faith in government. So we're going to talk, we're going to begin this project. We've done one panel, but we're going to begin this project uh, with, uh, th this will be the second panel in this project, and broaden it out from there, and I hope our panelists will help us participate, to talk about the purposes of government, what a co government accomplished in the past, economic policy, and so on. And we think it is, and I in particular think, it's the most important subject of our time to provide a counter narrative to the dominant narrative since I would argue the 1970s, but certainly since the Reagan era. Today we're going to talk about what I consider an especially important subject in part because it has been so long neglected by the economics profession. You would think it wouldn't be. But for the most part, economists have not talked for 20 or 25 years, and the, the experts on our panel can talk a little more, more accurately about this, about how recessions affect the long-term potential of economies to grow. That is our subject today. To, uh, to the contrary, economists in recent years have been talking about the great moderation, that we found the policy solution to economic, uh, to economic growth, that moderate, low, volatile growth was the answer to all our problems, that some form of inflation targeting by the monetary authorities, hard or soft, was the main policy tool that would make all well, that we needn't worry about asset prices. And therefore, we didn't think very much about how recessions might affect things like capital investment, human capital, labor, uh, uh, labor skills, and on and on. We didn't think very much about the possibility that an economy could stagnate for long periods of time. Those are specifically 
the questions the panelists will be discussing tonight. I am going to speak no further because they have a lot to say. Each of them will talk for 20 minutes. We will then have, I hope, at least 30 minutes to talk among ourselves on the panel and with you, the audience, to fill out and question the panelists, fill out some of the discussion. The panelists are, and we will begin with Bill Dickens, Distinguished Professor of Economics and Social Policy at Northeastern. He will be followed by Bruce Greenwald, who, what do you call that, Bruce? The value, uh, the family name, Green, Mr. Greenwald, but he is uh, the Heilbrun, uh, Heilbrun Professor at Columbia Business School. Larry Ball will follow him, Professor of Economics at Johns Hopkins, and then Till von Wachter from Columbia University's Economics Department. Uh, Bill will talk about some, all of them will be, be talking about current research they're doing. Bill will begin by addressing some research he is doing on fiscal stimulus. So why don't we get right to it, uh, and then I'll uh, tell you a little bit about what each of the others will be discussing. Bill? Thanks, Jeff. Um, Jeff is being a little bit modest because uh, the work I'm going to be reporting on is actually joint work uh, with Jeff, um, to the extent that uh, a lot of the background for this presentation um, is stuff that was put together by Jeff and I for a, a conference, and it draw the work I'm doing draws very heavily on it, and I'm counting on Jeff ultimately fulfilling his uh, duty as a co-author and helping put the paper into plain English. Um, so let me see. Uh, oh, I hate the new... Yeah, slideshow at the top. Slideshow. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, so, as I just alluded to, this project began actually more like around 2007 when Jeff and I, who frequently would get together in cafes when he was in D.C. and I was there, uh, and complain about, complain to each other about how the economics profession wasn't paying any attention to what the long-run consequences of uh, short-run policies were. Um, and around the time when the recession looked like it was really beginning to bite, we decided to stop grousing and actually do something about it. And Jeff went out and got a grant for us from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, with which we held a conference at the Brookings Institution in 2009. And at that conference, we had a number of economists present papers on the link between the short run and the long run. And some of the effects that were discussed was, first of all, the fact that research and development activity declines notably during recessions and some of the reasons for that. Uh, the impact of prolonged unemployment on the Nehru. Uh, Professor Ball was there, and he uh, contributed to that discussion. Uh, the impact of fluctuations on the accumulation of physical and human capital were also discussed by some of the papers at that meeting. What I'm trying to do is to try to put all of those things together now into a single number uh, to come up with an estimate of how important all of those things taken together might be. The idea was that, this was, was that this was going to be something easy, something I could work out on the back of an envelope with a little bit of a structured model. Um, and uh, I had a rather simple idea of what the model would look like. However, um, at this point, if it's going to fit on the back of an envelope, it's probably going to have to be the envelope that that check came in. Uh, the thing sort of grew out of hand. Um, Despite that, it's really sort of a basic kind of model. Uh, I tried to make it as simple as I possibly could. Ultimately, what I would like to do, at least in order to impress my uh, colleagues in the economics profession, it would be relatively easy to embed this sort of thing into a stochastic, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model with, uh, uh, with sticky prices. Calibrating it would be something of, of, a, of a pain, but it would ultimately, I think, give pretty much the same answers that what I'm getting right here. What I have is a model, very simple model, where uh, in the long run, the model just follows CBO's growth projections for the, for the capacity of the economy. In the short run, it deviates from that according to CBO forecasts without the jobs bill. Then what I do is I use CBO multipliers to figure out what the impact of the jobs bill 
will be on um, on the level of GDP and then work out a number of consequences of that increase in GDP. And uh, so, um, the productive capacity of the economy, which determines its growth in the long run, is described by a standard economic production function that depends on the number of workers that are available at full employment, uh, their level of education, the amount of physical capital that the economy accumulates over time, and the level of technological development. And uh, the basics of the model, continuing, talk about unemployment. So here's where the first place is that we introduce uh, a difference from the standard model. In the standard economic model, there is a long-run natural rate of unemployment, which is the lowest rate you can get unemployment down to without causing accelerating inflation, according to standard economic theory. And that rate uh, is just constant and fixed over time. But as uh, Professor Ball has suggested, uh, if we look at Europe, that doesn't seem to be at all the case, that if there's prolonged high unemployment in a country, it also seems that it doesn't go back down after the recession is over. Rather, it just stays high. There's a ratchet effect. Now, we haven't experienced that in the United States, but as Professor Ball has suggested, that may very well because be because we've been very, very aggressively using monetary policy and sometimes fiscal policy to bring unemployment rates back down after a recession, something we aren't doing this time. Uh, we have a very high unemployment rate for a very long period of time, so it's quite possible that we will start seeing the sorts of effects that they see in Europe. So we incorporate that into the model by allowing uh, the longer the unemployment rate stays high, the more the Nehru moves up. We calibrated the moving up part to what goes on in Europe. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we, we want all of the parameters in the model to be fairly conservative, uh, because uh, with very reasonable values, we're getting very, very large, with very conservative values, we're getting very, very large effects. So in this case, uh, we allow the, uh, uh, the effect to go away once the economy returns to full employment, or rather once the economy, uh, yes, returns to uh, potential output, it disappears at the rate of about a fifth of, a, of, a, uh, uh, of, the, of the difference of the Nehru from the previous Nehru every year. Um, so compared to Ball's findings, this is this is it would be a very rapid return. I would justify it on the grounds that hopefully uh, we would eventually pursue aggressive policy to bring us back to full employment, even if that required a little bit of inflation. And Professor Ball's research suggests that that could work. Um, productivity growth. Um, ultimately, we'd like to pursue a model in which productivity growth is entirely dependent on the state of the economy, uh, what's called an endogenous growth model. Uh, but here what we've done is sort of put together a hybrid where growth just happens, that it's at a f the fixed rate that, uh, that the CBO thinks that growth is going to happen at, that uh, productivity growth that is, and that's just going to be there unless the GDP falls short of full employment, in which case that causes a decline in the rate of, uh, of technological progress relative to the, the baseline growth rate. Um, and then what happens is that when we put the stimulus into effect, there's less of that decline, and so we go less below the, um, the potential uh, uh, productivity growth rate, and ultimately we, we return to it in the long run. Uh, we assume that the depreciation of, of technological change is about 18% per year, which means that the thing, the uh, uh, actual productivity returns to the, to the CBO's predicted growth path at the rate of about 18% per year. Um, physical capital investment. Um, this turns out to be really important. What we know about physical capital investment is that it's more pro-cyclical than the economy as a whole. That means that the share of investment climbs during good times in, in the GDP, climbs during good times, and falls during the bad times. And so what we've done is calibrated the model off of that past experience of how much investment goes up and down with the business cycle. And so the, if in the presence of a fiscal stimulus, we're going to get more investment, which in turn is going to affect the capacity of the economy 
which then in the medium run is going to raise the potential output sum and is going to allow us to get to a higher level of output than we would otherwise have gotten to uh, in the future for some period of time before it reverts back to the, the standard growth path. Um, human capital model. Um, here at or human capital uh, investment, investment in education and, and on-the-job training. Um, our investigation of the literature on this and our, also our own uh, analysis of the data suggest the same thing, which is in fact uh, there doesn't seem to be much impact of the economy on uh, the extent of human capital investment. Uh, we observe two offsetting tendencies which have been discussed in the literature. On the one hand, people have less money to afford to go to school during bad times. On the other hand, they have more time on their hands and the job market opportunities aren't as good so that may send more people to school and evidently those two offsetting effects are just about offsetting so that we don't see much going on there. On the other hand, uh, unemployed are not accumulating on the job training uh, which if we look at what happens to people's wage profiles over their lifetime and assume that some fraction of that is in fact due to their increased productivity from working at the same job for some time then that actually could matter. Uh, so we take into account the fact that people who are out of the labor force are not developing new skills and in fact may even be losing some of their skills and that's another thing that can have a long run impact on the economy. So what is it we're actually going to look at? Um, we wanted to look at what this means for the government budget. Um, we hear that we can't afford to engage in stimulus. Uh, we have uh, a buildup of debt and there seems to be an assumption in all of this discussion that a dollar spent on stimulus is a dollar added to the debt forever and always. Um, that need not be the case. For one thing, it's possible that a dollar worth of spending could actually lead to more than a dollar's worth of addition to the deficit in the long run because there's two things that are going on, um, and that is that, uh, uh, well, the, the important thing that's going on uh, from the perspective, well, one possibility, the reason why it could be worse is that uh, there, we, the one thing that is taken into account in standard models about the connection between short-run policy and long-run policy is crowding out, that government debt crowds out private investment. And so the CBO's model predicts, for example, that there's going to be a positive short run or that there was a positive short run effect of the original stimulus from 2009, but then it claims that the long run effect of that is actually to reduce growth because of this crowding out of physical capital. Um, on the other hand, uh, as we've discussed, there's um, the other possibilities, all of the things that I've mentioned before, that uh, the GDP is going to be larger uh, in the future as a result of a fiscal stimulus having indirect effects on the capacity of the economy to produce output. And in that case, uh, since the government revenues uh, go up when the GDP goes up, pretty much proportional to the growth of GDP, and right now the part of the budget that we're going to be talking about takes about 12% of GDP, so raise the GDP by a dollar and you get 12 cents in additional revenue. And so we're going to look at whether we're increasing revenue or decreasing revenue in the long run and what effect the stimulus would have on the government budget. I want to mention here that to avoid a whole bunch of trouble, we're completely ignoring social insurance in this model. Uh, we're just taking all the devoted revenue streams that pay for those sort of things out of the government sector and all of the expenditures that come out of those programs out of the government sector. We're only talking about the on-budget items that don't have devoted, um, devoted streams of, of revenue to support them. Okay. Um, oh, yes, and one more thing. To, to, fi to find out what's going to happen to government spending, what we do is we take the CBO's projections of government spending, which don't currently include the uh, Obama jobs plan, and we add in the Obama jobs plan as, it would, as the money would be spent over the next four years to see what that would do. Um, I already talked about... Oh, so what we're going to measure, the numbers I'm going to present you are the savings that result from a particular part of the long run impact of these things on the model. So I'll talk about um, uh, whether this, so whether this particular thing causes a, a, a savings in the sense that a dollar of, of, expen of expenditures costs less than a dollar. 
Um, you'll see what I mean when I get there. The way the model works is we simulate a thousand years of the model and then we actually project into the infinite future assuming the model is stable, which our experiments with the model suggest that it is at that point. Um, and uh, that's where the numbers you're going to see are going to be coming from. So each time I'm going to give you three different numbers because the CBO gives us two different, very, very different numbers for the government budget multiplier. Uh, and uh, actually they give actually a whole bunch of different numbers. They give different numbers for every category of spending or tax cut. And what we've done is weighted the, uh, those numbers by the fraction of each type of, of uh, expenditure or, uh, or tax cut in the president's job plan to come up with a single uh, multiplier uh, for each of their different values their high and their low value, and then we split the difference since there's a big difference between their high and their low value and present a medium value which is halfway in between the CBO's high and low estimate of what the multiplier effect of government spending will be. Um, so what I'm going to do is start off by showing you what happens, how much stimulus costs if there's absolutely no linking between the present and future uh, other than the, the fact that we get taxes in the future and we're spending money right now. Um, so we get some increase in revenue and as a re result of that, uh, we get an increase in the GDP and as a result of that we get some revenue. And then I'm going to introduce one by one all of the different things that I, I mentioned that link the present with the future and tell you how much more each one of those is going to save or how much more each one of those would save us on a dollar of spending and then finally I'm going to put them all together and give you a final set of numbers for what the cost of the jo president's job plan would actually be. So um, right away as I said you get back some of the money you spend since if you increase the GDP the increase in GDP means increased government revenues and depending on whether you use the low, um, the uh, medium, or the high estimate of the uh, CBO's multiplier, you either get back eight cents, sixteen cents, or twenty-four cents. So right off the bat, without any crowding out, anyways, uh, the government isn't spending a dollar to get a dollar. It's spending ninety-two cents, eighty-four cents, or seventy-six cents to get a dollar. Uh, actual to get a dollar's worth of stimulus effect. Um, so what happens if we're decreasing the output gap? Uh, that one of the things that I mentioned and probably the biggest effect in the model is the effect on technical change. As I mentioned in the beginning, what we observe is that investment in research and development spending falls a lot uh, during recessions. And it's been suggested that the main reason for this is that small and medium-sized firms that rely on bank financing or internal financing to, to pay for R&D, in a recession they're short money, they need cash to pay their fixed effects, and they save money everywhere they can, and since R&D is something that pays off only in the long run and doesn't provide short-run revenue, they'll often cut back on that. Um, so if we calibrate the model off of what we see as the typical decline in R&D spending and grab some numbers from the literature on the effect of R&D spending on productivity and the effect and then using our, our production function, the effect of productivity on GDP, what we get is that um, the smallest estimate suggests that uh, we save 38 cents more on the dollar uh, by uh, by investing in the stimulus, that, that it costs 38 cents less than what we would otherwise, uh, than what we would otherwise have said. Uh, in the second case, 74 cents left, and finally, in the in the in the with the largest CBO multiplier, uh, we get that uh, that the stimulus would actually pay for itself. That is, that uh, we would get a dollar nine back in revenue for every dollar we spent on the stimulus. So completely pays for itself and actually pays a little bit of a dividend uh, in the long run. Okay. Um, oh, that's not what... <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I see. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move a little bit more quickly. Uh, in the case of human capital investment, as I suggested, there wasn't much uh, that we saw. Uh, the effects that we built into the model were relatively small, so not much mattering there. 
Investment in physical capital was the second biggest effect, um, saving 17 cents, 32 cents, or 46 cents over that baseline that I gave you with none of the other effects in the model. Uh, and that's with a 3% uh, uh, cost of capital to the government um, and with the 2.7% number that we're using, which is the average real cost of capital to the government in the past, um, we get somewhat uh, we get only somewhat uh, larger numbers. Um, looking at uh, at uh, uh, the increase in the Nehru, which as I've already suggested is probably less than what uh, Professor Ball would like to see, uh, the additional savings are only four cents, seven cents, or ten cents. Um, if we put crowding out into the model, that adds to the cost, uh, depending on the size of the multiplier, 29, 18, or 7 cents on the dollar. And if we put all of this together, um, we get a pretty wide range of estimates, because uh, the crowding out effect comes in there with a large sign. But um, at the, using the CBO's lowest multi uh, multiplier, uh, we spend 88 cents to get a dollar's worth of, of, uh, of stimulus. And that, um, uh, that's still a heck of a lot less than what the, uh, what the CBO says, because they say it costs something like a dollar ten to get a dollar's worth of spending, to, to, uh, for a dollar's worth of stimulus spending. On the other hand, if we use the CBO's low end estimates, which I would actually argue are moderate uh, estimates, and we can get into that in the discussion, uh, the thing pays for itself. We get a dollar eleven back uh, for every dollar we spend, and even the CBO's median estimates suggest that a dollar of stimulus only costs thirty-eight cents. So, wrapping up, is this Keynes meets Laffer? Um, and uh, no, not really. Um, the tax cut multipliers are smaller than the spending multipliers. We haven't actually run a model with just pure tax cuts, um, but we suspect that. There wouldn't, we would not see the same thing coming out of, out of tax cuts, not the same magnitude at all, since there's a pretty big difference according to the CBO uh, there. The other thing is we're not including any supply side effects uh, from the tax cuts themselves. Um, and uh, there, if, they, if we did and there were tax cuts on capital, which is the only places where economists really find big effects, that could actually accentuate uh, what we're already finding. Finally, um, it's, you have to remember that this is about an economy that's in uh, a recession. This wouldn't work in an economy that's at full employment. The way we're getting the effects that we're getting is by bringing the economy closer to full employment during the period of time that the stimulus is affecting the economy, and that is something we can't do to the same degree. Presumably, there'd be a lot more crowding out uh, in other periods. So uh, Italy and Greece don't take don't think that you can get away with this. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bruce Greenwald actually has the value investing chair at Columbia called the Heilbrunn Chair, but he does a lot of theoretical work in macro issues. He's going to talk about the sources of the economic crisis and where we go from here. Bruce? Okay, let me just say one word I'd like to thank Bill for. The great tradition in these kind of events is for me to completely ignore what's been said before and give my own talk in a completely solipsistic frame of mind. But it turns out that I think that what Bill said inadvertently is a good introduction uh, to what I'm going to talk about. Um, when Bill talks about these effects, he's talking about these effects in the context of very traditional cycles where there's a shock and then there's a slow recovery and then you spend your time at full employment. That is an absolutely critical assumption behind everything that he's talking about and I think you want to start to ask the question therefore, when you talk about these long run effects in the present context as opposed to the traditional business cycle context, is the present context very different from that? And I think empirically, in a very simple way, you'd have to say yes. That this has been a much longer lived recession with a much more persistent level of unemployment 
than what we are used to seeing in the United States, even going back as far as the 1950s or the 1940 recessions. So what I'm going to talk about, in fact, is why I think this is a very different situation and there are very different things going on today than uh, traditionally have been talked about. Now, I also want to speak very briefly to a set of questions about the present crisis because I think that most of the public discourse is utterly misguided. Um, first of all, it seems to me this: there is overwhelming evidence that this is not a financial crisis. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, first, because if you look across the cross-section of countries, there is almost no correlation, and in fact, to the extent that there's any correlation, the financial crisis countries, which are predominantly initially at least the US and the UK, suffer less than average. The country, by the way, that suffered the biggest peak to trough decline among the developed economies is actually Finland, which has a banking system uh, in pretty good uh, shape. These are reasonable sized countries. I don't know if I'd treat Iceland as a country. Um, second thing is that if you look at banking failures, they're usually late in the cycle, they're not early in the cycle. And in fact, typically, except for some government takeovers, that large-scale banking failures and the consequences don't seem to have happened to the degree that there's this discussion. I know the simplest example of that is that there's an enormous amount of discussion about the TARP subsidizing the banks. In fact, the banking part of the TARP produced, I, I think it's something like a 13 to 18 percent return on the money that was lent to the banks. Uh, it's hard to say for sure because they're all the warrants that the government still owns. But it certainly was a profitable set of interventions. And if you look at the Fed's profits, they are absolutely extraordinary uh, through the early part of the cycle. Uh, the third thing I think is important is that the standard medicine for, and I don't understand why people believe this, but they do, for a financial crisis is, of course, an aggressive monetary policy to lower interest rates and lower the cost of capital, among other things, to financial institutions. And that's what we pursued with very little detectable effect really around uh, the world. I think, by the way, that that is symptomatic of something we should have known for a long time. And here is where I think I'm first going to disagree uh, with Bill's model a little bit, although much more with other people's models than his. There is a central embarrassment at the heart of all macro models. And it is this, that the way monetary and other policies work in part is through the interest rate. Nobody has ever been able to detect consistently a significant interest rate effect on any decisions of physical investment or savings, which is why the crowding out that Bill talks about is purely in Bill in the minds of other people. It's not there consistently uh, in the data. On the other hand, monetary policy did used to matter. If you look at the 1960s and you, looked at lag, you look at lag changes in just the M1 money supply, and then you look at a year later changes in nominal GDP, it's an extraordinarily tight relationship. If you try and look for that post-1990, it's completely gone away. In a sense, what seems to have happened is that when Alan Greenspan climbs into this seat of this car, which is monetary policy, which is historically very powerful and hard to drive, that they've disconnected the steering wheel from the wheels, so he's up there moving open market operations around like crazy. The car, which is basically stable, stays on the road, and he thinks he's a genius. Now, I'm not going to talk about why we think that's the case. This is Joe Stiglitz and I wrote a book about this, but Briefly, it used to be that there was a hidden tax and subsidy system of enormous power for the banks, that you had a zero interest rate ceiling on the interest on demand deposits, which was a tax on depositors, and a subsidy to the banks. And of course, the more deposits there were, the more you got of that subsidy. What deposits represented for banks was uh, because they never reduced the level of deposits. It was a permanent zero interest rate source of funds. And that is what equity is. So you made these direct equity investments in the banks. The problem is that that went away over the course of the 1980s predominantly as they removed those ceilings. And what you see all over the world is in the countries where they had those ceilings and took them away, the efficacy of monetary policy decreased uh, significantly. 
But I think the most important reason for not thinking this is a financial crisis, is to look actually at the pre-crisis conditions and what it took to have something near to full employment. And what it took from 2004 to 2007 was a housing bubble plus a 0% savings rate. Neither of those are obviously sustainable. The reason why the housing bubble is not sustainable should be clear, because there's long-run demand for housing. You overbuild, you build up the stock, you get excess supply of housing, housing prices collapse, and they don't recover because you've got this overhang of already built houses. It's like when you take home a pet, for those of you who have kids, it's a lot more pleasant to buy a pet than to have to drown it later. You're basically stuck with that pet. <laughs> When you build houses, it's fun to build them, but you're stuck with them later and they're a drag on the market. In terms of a zero savings rate, the thing is that the top 20% of households who have about 40% of permanent income, do about 40% of consumption, typically save 15% on average a year, re relatively rarely below that. Entrepreneurs save a lot more, other people save a little less. That by itself is a 6% savings rate. To get to a 0% savings rate, the other 80% of households who have to have, who have 60% of the income have to be dissaving 6% a year, which means they have to be spending 110% of their income every year. And if that's what's required to sustain reasonable growth, Without, by the way, significant inflationary pressure, there is a fundamental underlying problem uh, in the economy that, and especially at the level of aggregate demand, that's not being addressed. It is inevitable that savings has gone to between 5 and 6% where it is now. But by the way, if you think deleveraging is going to help, don't hold your breath. And I think this is another aspect of it's not being a financial crisis. Why? Because right now, those eight, bottom 80% of households are basically spending all their income. They're not going to go back to spending 110% of their income. That's not going to save you. The high-income households are saving 50%. That gives you the sort of 6% savings rate we've got. No amount of deleveraging is going to enable those low-income households to save, uh, to spend more than their income. And it's not going to enable the high, or, or it's not likely to make the high-income households save less than 15%. So you're not going to get a stimulus to demand. And the housing overhang isn't going away. So sort of praying for a housing bubble to come back is not likely to have any effect. At the same time, there has been a remarkable boom in the central category of investment in this recession, which is equipment and software. Now, business structures are in long-term decline, and they have, in fact, declined significantly. And that will probably recover a little. But the level of investment relative to GDP of software and equipment investment is higher in real terms than it was at the peak of the internet boom. So that there's not a lot of give in investment. So you want to ask yourself, given that there were all these things that are basically normal in terms of their impact on aggregate demand, how is it that we have this slow growth and the long-term recession? And in terms of the United States, the answer is absolutely straightforward. It is the foreign deficit. That at the peak of the boom between 04 and 07, the US was bleeding somewhere between 6 and 7% of aggregate demand in net overseas spending. And it's very hard to sustain full employment with that kind of an open wound in demand. Obviously, as the US economy has shrunk and growth has slowed down, that that deficit has shrunk. But the problem with the stimulus, the way Bill calculates it is, if that is the heart of the problem, then as the US economy starts to grow again, that wound is going to start to bleed more rapidly. So you're going to go back to 6 or 7% foreign deficits, and the stimulus effects of the government are going to leak overseas. And it seems to me those are not calibrated into these models, which are not tied to the current situation. So I think what you want to ask yourself is, if deleveraging isn't going to help, if monetary policy isn't going to help, is there a chance that we are going to get rid of the deficit in our overseas accounts, which is the current account deficit, and substitute that foreign demand for domestic demand to stimulate the economy? And the answer, again, is don't hold your breath. 
because the source of that deficit seems to be long-term structural surpluses in foreign countries that are not going away. And the one iron law of international economics is when you add up over all countries, the sum of the surpluses and the deficits has to be zero. What that means is that Japan has a long-term surplus, China has a long-term surplus now, the oil countries have long-term surpluses, the Germans have long-term surpluses, and at the moment anyway, the resource producers also have long-term surpluses. Somebody's got to eat those surpluses. Actually, back in the late 90s, it was Korea, Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia. They had to borrow not in their own currency. That wasn't sustainable. Their currencies collapsed. The burden of those debts caused everybody to go bankrupt in those countries, and the economies collapsed. Guess what they did? They went from deficit to surplus, and they passed on the task of eating the surpluses to Russia, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, who collapsed in turn. Ultimately, those surpluses reside in the United States because we can borrow in our own currency. So what you have to ask is, what is it going to take to get rid of those surpluses? And there, I think, you get to what is the fundamental problem of what's going on. Those surpluses, in Japan it may have started out that they feel they're a resource poor country, they need a big margin of safety of imports over exports, but today those exports are the product of a manufacturing establishment. Same in Germany where you've got powerful companies and unions in manufacturing, same in China that has a manufacturing driven ghost strategy and if you look at their latest five year plan, it is also export oriented and therefore fundamentally manufacturing driven. Korea, Indonesia, Thailand basically are exporting manufacturers. How do they do it? They do it by undervaluing their currency. So we cannot stop them. Under their own accord, what would it take for them to stop aggressive exports? And the answer is if they could support their manufacturing sectors without having to have a huge surplus to sell overseas, which is if they could support it on domestic demand. And there is the heart of the problem, because manufacturing is dying. And it's dying for the best of reasons. World demand growth is 2 to 3 percent, and productivity growth is somewhere around 5 to 7 percent. Employment is dying, prices, relative prices are dying, and value added is dying. So to support those sectors, they have to more aggressively export. And until they have alternative employment, it seems to me they're not going to continue, they're not going to stop manipulating their currencies, offering subsidies to these sectors to export. What's worse is everybody talks about loving manufacturing. People want to save manufacturing jobs in the United States, and it's not going to happen. Now, the question is, have we seen this before? And the answer is, it seems to me, yes. The last time this sort of imbalance of a major sector that is geographically isolated around the globe dying occurred is, of course, in the Great Depression. And the sector is agriculture. And what happens is agricultural prices collapse, agricultural incomes collapse, and people cannot afford to move. So they're stuck in agriculture. So now agricultural wages don't recover and agricultural output keeps going up because there's essentially a zero cost of labor. And that makes the agricultural problem worse. And there's no obvious way to save that because, of course, as agricultural incomes collapse, agricultural demand for yeah manufactured goods collapse also, and they bring the manufacturing sector down with them. And you see that in the Depression, by the way. If you look at agricultural population, it falls quite a lot in the 20s. It falls not at all in the 30s when agriculture is in the worst possible shape because they're trapped there. What finally solves the problem is a degree of government intervention which is superbly but inadvertently developed industrial policy, and it is World War II, because it gets everybody off the farms, into the factories and into the army. And then when the war is over because of the temporary excess demand in the United States because of the forced saving and the needs of reconstruction in Europe, there is enough transitional demand to keep those people off the farms, and you see this extraordinary drop between 1940 and 1945, finally in the agricultural population of the United States. 
what it took, therefore, to cure the Depression. And by the way, the great surprise to Keynes and to the great Keynesian, I'm going to finish in a second, and to the great Keynesian in the United States, who is Paul Samuelson, is that there is no renewal of the Depression after the war. In fact, Paul Samuelson did a very aggressive forecast about how the Depression was coming back. It was so far off that he never made another economic forecast in his life. <laughs> And the reason is that it is not this simple Keynesian model, because the Keynesian model is a static model of kickstarting to get through something like the Depression. It seems to be that these different kinds of cycles, these very long life cycles, are the result of structural imbalances where a big sector dies and it's very hard to do the transition. What that means is that we are going to have to live with the current situation for a long time. This is not a short-term matter. And what it means is a lot of the calculations that Bill is talking about, with this exception of the fact that you do bleed the things overseas, are really appropriate without the return to full employment. Now, that's the basic story, and you're waiting for people to make the transition to services. I'm told that this is a big downer, and I should say some good things about this. So I want to finish off with four pieces of good news. First, none of this is apocalyptic. Big modern economies are still pretty stable. A 5 7% drop in GDP is pretty much what you could expect. It's not going to be a third down like the Depression. Second thing is, and it, again, it speaks to Bill's point, but something peculiar has happened in this recession, which is typically productivity growth drops by about 1.5% to 2% in a recession, and it is permanently lost. There's no recovery. That's a fact I learned from Bill years ago. That's an enormous cost. You capitalize that 2% of GDP cost at anything like a 4% real rate, it's 50% of GDP from the cost of a recession. But in this recession, productivity growth has held up. And that's why profits are doing so well, and employment, properly measured, is such a disaster. Three, there's a clear solution to this for the United States. I won't talk about it in detail because I don't have time, but it's protectionism. That we are not living in a free trade environment where you have manipulation of exchange rates. And if we recognize that and do a simple system of countervailing, basically, import permits, we can fix our problem in the red because we've already largely made the transition to services and just screw uh, the rest of the world. So. There is a way out. It's not going to be horrible. And there are some good things about the present situation. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Bruce. One of the great up stories of a very positive era for America. Glad you ended on those up notes. Actually, I did get some, see some glimmers of optimism in what you said. Uh, which I didn't expect because I once, you don't remember this, I once sat in on one of your classes. Uh, Larry Ball is going to talk mostly about labor, but he's also done some work on austerity economics, which I hope he'll discuss as well. Larry, thanks. Actually, yeah, because actually this turns off. So about uh, 7 uh, or 7.15. Uh, okay, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, I don't think there's much to be optimistic about. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to probably have the next Great Depression, uh, but I think to sort of get to right to the point, uh, the economy is going to drift along with 9 or 9 percent unemployment. You know, we're a quarter of the way through the lost decade, um, and uh, we're going to have a worse and worse problem of people uh, being unemployed for a long time, having their careers disrupted in an irreparable way, uh, having people come out of school and not be able to get jobs, having their lives be disrupted. So I mean, it won't be as bad as 20, you know, depends what you compare it to, it's not as bad as 25 percent unemployment in 1932, but it's um, uh, by far the you know, going to be very bad by post-World War II standards, and, and quite a come down after the, the great moderation that we were supposedly were in, which somebody spoke about. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to talk about prospects for unemployment, and uh, 
uh, weave in a, a few different research projects along the way and overlap with uh, the other speakers to some degree. So uh, between 2008 and 2010, the unemployment rate went from about 5% to about 10% uh, quite rapidly. There's nothing that unusual about that. Uh, in the early 1980s, unemployment went from 6% uh, to 10% uh, over a couple of years. Uh, in the mid-1970s, unemployment spiked at around 9%. Uh, what's different is that um, in the early 80s and the 70s, uh, in previous uh, post-war recessions, uh, after going up, unemployment's come back down uh, fairly quickly. So uh, again, the textbook case is the early 80s, where we have unemployment going from 6% uh, six to 10%, six to uh, but then uh, uh, comes right back down to 6% just in time for Ronald Reagan to declare mourning in America. Uh, and, then, and then it's all um, forgotten about after, after the mid-80s. Um, so um, w what I want to talk about is uh, why, is it, why do I think in, th in this recession, again, we've already seen unemployment stuck at a high level somewhat longer than, it, than we would normally expect. Why do I think it's going to stay stuck at a high level uh, indefinitely? And uh, is there anything uh, that could be done uh, to push unemployment down? And I think the answer there, again, frankly, quite pessimistic. I, I, I can think in principle of some policies that might help, uh, but there's no way politically they're going to happen. So, uh, you know, so, so we just have to, to, to be ready to uh, live with 9% unemployment for a long, or close to that for a long time. Um, OK. Um, all right, now, uh, uh, first of all, mainstream macro theory says uh, that uh, an increase in unemployment in a recession uh, should be temporary. So, um, uh, so I, I, I do think this recession was caused by things in the financial system. We can discuss that later. Uh, I, I think the financial cr cri crisis uh, disrupted um, uh, uh, the the financial system was disrupted enough that there were big effects on consumption and investment, and uh, that caused aggregate demand to fall, and that caused unemployment to rise. Uh, again, uh, mainstream textbooks have a very sharp distinction between that kind of short-run effect uh, and the long-run neutrality of, of shifts in demand. Uh, so uh, after seeing um, a, a, a fall in demand push unemployment up, uh, we should now be in the middle of the recovery phase. Uh, and again, uh, the United States economy has obeyed uh, mainstream textbooks pretty well uh, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, but, now, but now it's misbehaving. Um, now, this sh shouldn't be too surprising if we look beyond the United States, uh, because while the U.S. pattern since World War II has been uh, sharp but brief increases in unemployment, which are reversed, uh, in many other countries, notably many European countries, we've seen unemployment go up and then stay very high. So in the 1980s and 1990s, um, uh, many uh, European countries uh, had unemployment. Uh, uh, there used to be an industry back in the 60s and 70s of uh, uh, early 70s of writing about uh, why is unemployment in Europe so much lower than the U.S. Uh, then there were these uh, big recessions that pushed unemployment uh, uh, to, to 9 or 10 percent in a lot of European countries. Uh, so we had a decade or two of what's wrong with Europe uh, to cause unemployment to be so high. Uh, now uh, unemployment is high everywhere. Um, but if we look at, uh, so, uh, so like a classic example would be uh, the UK in the early 1980s. Uh, so the UK and the US had uh, quite parallel histories in the early 1980s up to a certain point. Um, uh, each country had a high inflation. Each country instituted very uh, restrictive monetary policy to reduce inflation. Paul Volcker in the U.S., uh, Margaret Thatcher in the U.K., because uh, the Bank of England was not independent of the government at that point. Uh, we got parallel increases in unemployment. Uh, but then the countries diverged, that um, uh, while we got mourning in America and the U.S. with unemployment coming back down uh, in 83, 84, uh, unemployment stayed high uh, in, in the U.K. Uh, in, in, until the late 80s. And it's actually more extreme, France, Italy, uh, uh, Italy unemployment rose in the early 80s and it was uh, until the 2000s before you see, saw unemployment uh, go down substantially. 
So if you look both uh, across countries and over time, um, I, I think it's a fact that when unemployment rises, uh, sometimes it comes uh, back down pretty quickly, uh, and sometimes it gets stuck at a high level. So an obvious question is what accounts for that, and why do I think uh, this U.S. episode will be one uh, with unemployment being stuck, uh, stuck at a high level? Um, okay. And, and, and this is something that I and, and others have done research on. Now, um, uh, a, a lot of people have noted that unemployment, maybe they're not as pessimistic as I am, but a lot of people have noted that um, unemployment is coming down more slowly than one would expect uh, in the current recession. And there's there are a lot of talk about that. Uh, there are the so-called structural theories. Um, Narayana Kuchlakota, the Minneapolis Fed president, talking about, um, well, there's a mismatch of workers and jobs. There are plenty of jobs, except they're all nursing jobs, and we have construction workers, and the, there's no way. And probably for this audience, I don't have to uh, go into that too much. It's prob probably not, pro probably deservedly not a popular theory here. Um, uh, I, I think um, it, it, it's pretty extreme to say that the basic problem is anything except a shortfall in demand, which is causing a shortage of jobs pretty much throughout the, throughout the economy. Um, now, uh, I think one very common and, and seemingly plausible view is that uh, what's special about this episode is the fact that we've had a financial crisis and such a big fall in housing prices. Um, now, I, th I think I, I part, maybe partly agree and partly disagree with Bruce. I mean, I, I do think it was events in the financial system which caused um, this recession. Um, but, but I don't think uh, the fact that that was the cause is the reason that the recovery is, is so slow. Uh, because again, looking historically at, at the European cases, uh, uh, like uh, increases in many European countries in the 1980s, uh, again, the fundamental cause of that was disinflationary monetary policies. Um, nothing especially bad happened to the banking sector. Uh, it was the same kind of policies which in uh, the U.S. caused only a temporary increase in unemployment. So, so um, uh, I, I don't think that what caused uh, the recession in the first place, while an interesting question, uh, determines whether or not we're going to have a, a quick recovery. Now, um, so uh, in, in, in my view, based on my research and other people's research, and I think disagreeing with Bruce, uh, the, the key factor is monetary policy. Um, that uh, looking across um, uh, different countries and time periods, uh, the cases in which you've seen unemployment come back down after a recession have been cases in which there's been vigorous countercyclical monetary policy. Um, uh, there's a paper by uh, David and Christine, uh, David and Christy Romer uh, called "What Ends Recessions" in 1994. It's actually not very well known. It's actually only the sixth or seventh best known Romer and Romer paper, but but I recommend it. And it it basically looks at all the recessions in the U.S. from uh, World War II until 1994 and says what forces caused unemployment to go back down. And, and the answer in every case is the Fed saw that unemployment was high. They lowered interest rates. If unemployment didn't come down at that point, they lowered interest rates some more. Uh, they kept doing it quite aggressively until unemployment uh, came back down. Uh, that was 1994. I think it's uh, held the same pattern happened in the recession in the early uh, 2000s. Um, uh, Romer and Romer also do counterfactual experiments um, based on, on estimates of how uh, strong the effects of monetary policy are about um, what would have happened in these recessions if monetary policy had been more passive, uh, and, and they suggest that the unemployment would have stayed high much longer. Um, now, I, I think we actually see what what's, what's a, was a counterfactual in U.S. history is what we actually saw in a lot of European countries. Uh, it, it might seem uh, obvious that a responsible central bank uh, will start um, countercyclical policy if it sees unemployment be high, uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, again, I think the U.K. is an early, a very interesting example. There, I think the fundamental uh, issue was that Margaret Thatcher was uh, an anti-inflation zealot. Uh, Paul Volcker, despite having this anti-inflation reputation, actually had quite a balanced policy of, of, of uh, tightening policy to push inflation down, uh, but then quite quickly shifting gears uh, and loosening policy to help the economy recover. Whereas for, for Margaret Thatcher, inflation was like some kind of vampire that you can't just kill at once. You know, you have to, you know, kill it ten times and you know 
burn it and blow it up. And so, so even after inflation was conquered, policy was kept very tight well into the late 1980s. And that's why unemployment stayed high. Uh, in other European countries, um, uh, the reason why policy was not countercyclical was uh, exchange rate considerations. Con uh, uh, France, uh, Italy, and so on uh, were in the European monetary system in the 1980s, the precursor to the euro. Um, and uh, you could actually read contemporaneous policy statements uh, from France, the Bank of France, saying it, it's it really a shame that we have a recession. Wouldn't it be nice if we could cut interest rates to deal with that? Uh, but, if, but, but that would um, a, a, allow. Um, that, that would cause our currency to depreciate, and we, we can't possibly allow that because of the euro project, um, which is going to lead to a common currency which will last forever. But anyway, that's another story. Um, um, all right, so uh, now uh, in, in the U.S., I think the Fed is not run by anti-inflation zealots like Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the U.S. is not constrained by any exchange rate policy. Uh, the U.S. has a different problem, which is simply the zero bound. Um, uh, again, um, I, I disagree with Bruce. I think that lowering interest rates uh, is a very powerful tool, and we wouldn't be having this discussion. We'd be well in the recovery um, um, and um, you know, toasting the latest morning in America uh, if, if only the Federal Reserve could lower the federal funds rate to, to negative 4%. Uh, I mean, if you look at the Taylor Rule, a standard guide to monetary policy, that's what it says um, uh, the, 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 the federal funds rate should be, you know, if you came from some planet where negative nominal interest rates were possible, uh, you know, you would think that the Fed had suddenly lost its mind keeping, you know, why are you suddenly keeping rates 400 basis points higher than they should be? But, but so, um, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but, but um, uh, so, I, so I think that's, so I think uh, generally the cases in which you see unemployment stay high are cases in which for one reason or another, uh, monetary policy is not, uh, 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 doesn't respond strongly enough. Uh, and, and the reasons for the inadequacy of monetary policy are different in different episodes. In this episode, it's the zero bound. Now, I'm running out of time. I want to talk about fiscal policy, but, um, on, on monetary policy, seven minutes. Seven, minutes, oh, <laughs> uh, seven minutes to fully uh, uh, analyze all monetary and fiscal policy. On, on monetary policy, um, of course, there's a lot of discussion about, well, um, we, we can't lower interest rates anymore, but we can do, quote, unquote, unconventional monetary policy. So the Fed is doing quantitative easing, operation twist, so on and so forth. Long story short, and we can discuss this more, um, those are, are very modest steps. When people uh, look at the data, you can maybe find that quantitative easing has lowered interest rates by 0 0.15 percentage points. I, I think quite to the contrary of being some radical dangerous policy, they're very timid policies. Uh, there's a lot more the Fed can, uh, could do. Uh, just for example, in, in 30 seconds, uh, they could have quantitative targets for long-term interest rates. They could say, we're going to push the five-year Treasury rate to zero. Um, they could say, uh, we're going to buy lots and lots of foreign currency to depreciate the dollar. They could say, we're going to target 4% inflation instead of 2% inflation. They could say, uh, we can have a helicopter drop or, or get together with the Treasury and have a money finance fiscal expansion. Uh, the, the reason why I mention these four ideas is, is that ironically, and I'm sure some of you know this probably, uh, these were all proposed by Ben Bernanke uh, in the early 2000s when he was ridiculing the Bank of Japan uh, for their passivity and paralysis was the word he used um, uh, in dealing with their slump. Um, uh, so uh, Christy Romer said, um, well, I guess Paul Krugman, you know, always has the sarcastic bon mot, said something like, uh, you know, we're in bad shape if only Ben Bernanke were chairman of the Fed, you know, then we'd be in better shape, you know, meaning the Ben Bernanke of the early 2000s. It's an interesting question about why is it political pressures or why is it the Fed is so passive, uh, uh, isn't doing truly aggressive things. Now, you know, straight on to fiscal policy, um, uh, as Bill suggested, I think, you know, mainstream uh, uh, people, this congressional, office, congressional Budget Office, think that there are significant multipliers. Uh, we could, can I get some more water before? Yeah, is that your water right Oh, it's my water, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, there seem to be uh, positive multipliers. If we had a, 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 another big fiscal expansion, uh, that would, uh, go in the right direction in helping the economy recover and pushing unemployment down. 
Uh, of course, that's not going to happen. Quite to the contrary, uh, politically, we're moving towards um, a uh, fiscal tightening because of the perception that we uh, have a, a horrible problem, which, which, which we do, of uh, uh, ending, uh, ballooning uh, long-term uh, national debt. Um, and I think the research that Jeff alluded to, uh, there's a, there's a, a um, school of thought among both, um, uh, to put it bluntly, Republican members of Congress and economists who ought to know better, uh, uh, that um, we, don't, you know, we don't like to face unpleasant trade-offs, that, that uh, if we uh, cut the budget deficit, that's actually what we need uh, to do to restore confidence in the U.S. economy, and uh, uh, that will get people spending and investing again. And you know, the, the, the idea, again, you know, Paul Kuhn, you know, calls it the, the, debt, uh, the debt fairy, is that? Confidence. Con con confidence fairy, right. Um, uh, so uh, there's very interesting and important research uh, done at the International Monetary Fund in the last couple of years, uh, in which I've had a little bit of a role, but uh, uh, there's a big article in the World Economic Outlook about a year ago, uh, which I think, um, uh, you know, definitively debunks, debunks the confidence fairy. Uh, and specifically, if you know the literature, there's a paper by Alicina and Ardania uh, uh, which is quoted a lot, and I think sort of d definitively, you know, I don't nearly have time, um, but sort of it, it explains the biases in the, uh, the uh, research that seems to um, uh, support the confidence fairy, and, uh, uh, and then has a very careful examination of a hundred and some uh, examples of fiscal consolidations in uh, different countries in the last several decades, um, and finds pretty conclusively that um, uh, that, that uh, he, he, here the mainstream textbooks have it right, that, um, uh, that, that the fiscal consolidation which is coming uh, is probably going to, uh, is, is going to worsen things. Um, uh, we could get into, there, there's some numbers we could get into, but um, so, um, so, so overall, again, I think, um, uh, you know, I don't really have any any jokes to end with because it, I mean, it really is. If you think about it all seriously, you know, and think about the human consequences, or if anybody knows, um, you know, anybody graduated from college looking for a job, or anybody who's lost a job, um, I, I think things are not going to get better. Um, uh, and I, I sort of forgot that there's the whole academic idea of hysteresis that, um, which I, uh, Bill alluded to that. Um, uh, mainstream theory, again, says that unemployment, once it goes up, has a natural tendency to go back down. Uh, in, in fact, there seem to be some mechanisms by which unemployment perpetuates itself, whether it's uh, workers losing skills or becoming detached from the labor force. But, uh, but uh, I think actually the, the mechanism is not very well understood. But I think the historical evidence is clear that if unemployment goes up by itself, there's no natural tendency for it to come back down. Uh, it, it needs some help. Um, monetary policy is not going to help. Uh, fiscal policy is probably going to be counterproductive. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that we're in stagnation indefinitely. But again, I mean, this, this could sound like a joke, but it's really not funny. I mean, what, what could upset the equilibrium is, you know, who knows? I mean, I, if, if unemployment is 9 percent, Obama is going to win one state. And, you know, we can speculate about who the president's going to be uh, and, and who that person will appoint as chair of the Fed. And, um, you know, crazy things could happen that could make things much, much worse. Um, so um, I think sort of stag stagnation uh, where we are for, for the next uh, decade is the, the sort of the best case scenario. Thanks. I hate to tell you this, but with all this optimism in the room, uh, Till von Wachter, who aside from me is the junior member of this panel, it, I was, that was a joke, uh, is going to talk about the damage done to wages uh, over the long run in recessions. Till, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I thought actually that I was going to be the one uh, giving the bad news. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm probably outdone three times. Uh, so not only the junior member, I'm also the labor economist of the group. And as, as you know, that means that my goals are going to be a little bit more modest. And, and what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the effect of 
the recession on workers most affected, which means job losers, unemployed workers, and, and people graduating, entering the labor market in a recession. And um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to first to spend some time to reviewing some research I've done on the effects of these workers. And then I'm going to come back to sort of the bigger question, can we learn anything from the micro evidence on whether the recession sort of has helped long sort of medium run productivity or hurts medium run productivity. So in other words, have we just gone through a beneficial the process of creative destruction? Right? So in the sense of a short term pain in favor of some long term gain, right? Or is what happens or is what happens? Oh. Okay. Um, or is what happens that the, the recession itself has sort of created some inefficiency that hurts the recovery, right? Now, we're certainly have gone, talking about creative destruction, we've gone to a lot of job destruction, so as, you, as you all know. And uh, the key question is, well, how, how are the workers affected who were either lost their jobs in this recession uh, or became unemployed or entered the labor market in this recession? So I'm going to focus on these workers because those are the ones who are going to be more likely most affected by uh, the current slack labor market. And since I don't have a crystal ball to see what happens to the workers laid off in this recession, I'm going to go back and look at workers who were affected by the 1982 recession. And so that's your, we have a good 20 to 25 years to look at. And um, the 1982 recession has a couple of useful things going for it for, for this purpose in the sense that it, it was a very large, it was the biggest recession since the Second World War prior to this recession that the double digit unemployment rates uh, and it was very much driven by a large amount of job destruction. And uh, if you think, of course, there's important differences, but a key difference is that after the 1982 recession, there was actually a recovery in employment. And in this recession, the, the stagnation in, in unemployment is, 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 is severe, right? And so you could, in a way, think of the estimates I'm going to show you from the 82 recession as sort of a best case scenario, right? If, if you think that a prolonged sort of weak labor market actually hurts recovery prospects of workers. No. What do we do to, to learn about the uh, long-term effects of, of job displacement in the 82 recession? Well, we got data from the Social Security Administration, and these are, uh, it's a 30-year longitudinal data set where for we see workers' entire career paths for 30 years, and we also see the long-term uh, evolution of their employers. Right? So, and what we can do, we, we use the employer records to isolate employers that had sudden very large drops in employment. And we, we call that a mass layoff. So we look at employers that had a big restructuring, and then we found workers that had been at their employers for a while, so were expected to stay. And then we're going to compare these workers, um, let go at a mass layoff, to similar workers who were not displaced. So we're going to do a simple treatment control comparison. And the nice feature of the data we're using, we're going to do that over 20 years. And then today, we're mainly going to focus on annual earnings, which is if somebody is, doesn't work, they'll have zero earnings in this case. But you, you can you know, replicate similar estimates for many different outcomes from this data. And this is sort of what, what we find. That was sort of on a front page, front page article in the New York Times. And the New York Times guys actually made a much more beautiful picture than I did in my paper. So I'm actually taking their, essentially their picture. What you see here is um, uh, uh, for, from 1974 to 2000, average annual earnings for two groups of workers in thousands of dollars. So the, the pink line, the lower line, is the workers who lost their job in a mass layoff in uh, 1980. And then the blue line is the, the line for workers who are similar, these are men, by the way, who held stable jobs but did not lose their job in, the early, in, 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 the, in 1980. So they were, they were stable for a few more years. And the message of the figure is, is reasonably clear. Prior to the job loss, these two groups of workers, so if you still want the treatment and control group, had, had parallel evolution of earnings, and the, the, the stable workers had slightly higher earnings, which you, know, could, you can easily explain that, but the difference was stable. At the uh, job loss, there's a large decline in earnings, and then there's a little bit of a recovery, really, but the key message is that there was a small difference in earnings beforehand and a much bigger difference in earnings you know, afterwards, and that difference in earnings lasts for 20 years. So uh, by, by this straightforward comparison, um, you know, being present in a mass layoff and losing your job in the early 1980s recession was bad for you, at least bad for the long-term earnings outcomes. And now it turns out that you can do much, much more sophisticated comparisons than this simple treatment control comparison, try to control for any possible differences 
of, of these groups of workers or of the firms laying off. And this result is, is very stable. So losing your job during a mass layoff in the early 80s knock, knocks earnings down for about 15 to 20 percent over the next 15 to 20 years. So these are very, you know, significant losses. Now, it's worth, so today we're going to mainly talk about earnings. It's worth taking a little detour and thinking about other outcomes that, that uh, uh, job losers have. And the reason is because we always, we have, it's easy to measure earnings, it's harder to measure income. And so it, it could, in principle, be that the earnings loss is much bigger than the income loss. So we don't really capture how well workers are doing who lost their job. It's one reason. The second reason is, you know, the earnings loss may partly be a function of a choice. So these workers may have accepted lower wages for, say, better working conditions. And, and so we, in some sense, overstate the private cost of a job loss by looking at earnings. And, um, and you can do replicate the same sort of treatment control comparison for the whole range of outcomes. And then you find that, well, uh, other than large earnings losses, workers go through a, a long period of uh, instability in both earnings and, and jobs. So they're more likely to be laid off again. They're more likely to become unemployed again. They have a higher variance in earnings, all things that are considered as so not as pleasant. And then you also find that job loss has short-run effects on health. Job loss has also very long-run, can have very long-run effects on health. So the mortality rate of displaced workers can go up. And that difference, that, that rise in the mortality rate, in, the, in very bad cases, can last 15 to 20 years. And you know, there's also increasing evidence that children of job losers have lower schooling outcomes. And that sort of these negative effect on, on, on children, right? persists into adulthood of these children. So there are true intergenerational negative effects of job displacement. Right? So to make a long story short, you can, you can cut it many different ways. Job losers typically experience uh, um, uh, negative outcomes on a whole range of, of uh, uh, experience a whole range of negative outcomes. Right? So there's no real evidence that these adverse earnings losses are sort of offset by other good things. No, instead it looks like bad things just come together. So it's pretty clear, I think, from the existing evidence um, that I ran you through, is that there are large personal costs for the workers uh, who, who lose their job. But it's, what is not so clear for our purposes to think about, well, are these just personal costs or are these true costs to society beyond these personal costs? Why, why does that matter? Well, you could think of a case where the people who were losing their jobs were people who had job, uh, above average wages. So there, you know, there, we know that there are some sectors in the economy and some firms in the economy just, who just have better job and pay higher wages. And uh, it could be that the, these are the workers who lose their jobs, and then it may, it's, it's certainly a personal cost for the worker, but it, it, it is, actually might be better for society if these overpaid workers are losing their jobs. Right? But we, we, you know, we don't know the answer to that. Another scenario could be that these workers are losing some skills that were specific to their firm or to their occupation. And so it's, it's potentially costly to society, but on over, overall, it may be beneficial. So that's the creative destruction scenario. So we, we incur some, some pain in, a, in destruction of skills, say, but that's beneficial for growth, right? And then and a third scenario is that you know, workers lose skills, we really, really destroy some productive potential, and that's actually inefficient. There's no gain from it, from say, effi efficient reorganization, right? So um, we really would like to distinguish between these three cases when we're thinking about sort of the macroeconomy as opposed to the, the what's happening to the single worker. And and that's hard. There is some evidence from from job losers that you could think of bringing to the bear, bear to the matter, but I'll leave that to the discussion. Instead, I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to think about this question for people who entered the labor market. Now, people to, who entered the labor market in recession for the first time are helpful because they have nothing to lose in terms of skills. They're, they, they can't be overpaid, right? And if there's some, you know, beneficial adjustment process going on, they're certainly the ones that should benefit from it because they're just entering sort of in a sense at the right time and they should be benefiting from that creative part and not be hurt by the destruction part. Right? So that's one reason why we study so the, the effects of people entering the labor market in a recession. And that's what we did. And here's a figure where we show the earnings losses of people who graduate in a recession. These are college graduates. And is, this is Canadian data for reasons that, uh, well, what, it, it's much better. But you, you find the same pattern in the US data. And uh, the, the vertical axis, see that the 
you can think of these as the percentage losses for each point of the unemployment rate that, that you face uh, at graduation. And you have three lines for the top, middle, and bottom of the expected earnings distribution based on the college and the major and the number of years of education you had. So we group people in how well we think they're going to do based on past experience. And then we compare the people who graduate in a recession with people who graduate sort of in more normal economic times. And this is sort of, we do that for every year since graduating, and that's what you see on the horizontal axis. And the message is clear. The average worker, which is the blue line, experienced sort of a 10-year decline in earnings. So there's a, there's a big drop initially, and that sort of fades. Now, that's for the average recession. For a big recession such as this one, you could think of that line shifting in parallel down, and then the recovery would take, just say, 15 years, for example. So the 82 recession in the US actually led to a, a, a more persistent recovery path. Um, and so the average worker loses between sort of 6 and 8% of their lifetime earnings. But if you look at different groups of college graduates, the top college graduates, sort of those from the better schools, they recover quite quickly, and the bottom college graduates, these are humanity, essentially humanities major from smaller state school. They never quite recover. So there are people here who have permanent earnings losses. And things don't look too good for high school graduates either. So from, from looking at uh, college, from, from labor market entrance, there's no evidence that there's any beneficial effect from entering in a recession. Uh, instead, it looks like the recession is caused sort of, sort of for persistent negative effects. So there, there are many possible explanations for this, but certainly there's no indicator that these people are benefiting in a way from entering in a great period of sort of restructuring. Yeah. Where, where, where does that leave us? Well, there's no evidence from uh, job losers or from labor market entrants that uh, recessions are in, in any way uh, healthy for the labor market or healthy for sort of uh, medium-term uh, growth. And that evidence also holds if we think about other indicators from the labor markets. For example, there's the bulk of adjustment in the U.S. labor market is done by voluntary job mobility. So there's an incredible amount of transitions between jobs, and that is highly procyclical. So in a boom, there's an incredible number of workers switching jobs. That uh, uh, job switching rate just collapses in a recession, right? And then, and it is done in this recession. There's a sign that the recession, if, if there was any reallocation going on, it, 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 it's much reduced during recession. The wage gains that these workers have by switching jobs, it could signify some, some evidence of reallocation are also much smaller. And similarly, wages of the workers who keep their job are, are likely to, to grow much slower and, and persistently so. Right. If, if they started the job in a recession or if they were on that job during a recession. So there's very little evidence of any beneficial outcomes of recessions for workers. Uh, in fact, the majority of the evidence point to very dramatic losses for affected workers, both labor market entrants and job losers. And you know, so some additional evidence suggests that these are not only personal costs that are very long lasting, but they, they might be actually costs for society. Now, uh, what could we do, and what are the open questions? Um, so I've given several congressional testimonies, and so I've learned sort of to end on a positive note. Um, and so this is my small positive note, is that there is some policies that are available actually could help to raise the employment rate once job creation picks up, or, or even sort of spur job creation. And so say, say policies such as job search assistance or reemployment bonuses have been shown to help um, uh, re-employ workers and, and, and uh, uh, incentivize hiring. Now, for given the budget situation, none of these policies, the, the scale of none of, it, we're near, nowhere near the scale of these policies that we would need to actually make a dent into employment, right? But that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point is that there's no evidence that any of these policies affect the long-term earnings loss of these workers. So active labor market policies raise employment, but there's no evidence that any of these large earnings losses that you saw goes away or is sort of substantially reduced. There are two open uh, questions. First one, one are, we, are we sitting by as long-term unemployed workers keep losing their skills? And we, we don't know an answer to that question. But that's an important question. But should we be stepping in to reduce a further erosion of skills? We don't know. The second question is, 
a large number of the workers who are run out of unemployment insurance, who are long-term unemployed, might be ending up on, on other government programs, notably social security and disability insurance, that are much more costly than unemployment insurance or sort of short-term measures uh, to help the labor market. So we should start thinking of factoring in some of the costs of not more actively stepping in in our budget calculations. Thank you. I'm going to stand up here so that we have three mics available to the panelists. Uh, no. Uh, we have 25 minutes for discussion. We ha need three or four hours, needless to say. Let me just ask the panelists to respond to a couple of questions among themselves, and then I'll open it up to questions to you all. Uh, Bill, did you want to respond to Bruce's comments about... Uh, import leaks and so forth, and uh, uh, I assume the need for a gra global strategy of some kind. But sure. Um, is this okay. Um, first off, I I guess I'm looking at this point like the Pollyanna on the panel that actually <laughs> was presenting a model in which the economy was expected to return to full employment in a finite period of time. Um, my, po my program here is to talk to the CBO. I want to convince them that they ought to take these kind of things into account, or if they don't, that the people who are reading CBO studies of the long term or of the effects of fiscal stimulus um, will at least think that there might be that they that the cost might be a lot less than what the CBO is telling them. Um, consequently, I'm using a model I don't believe. Uh, if you, all you have to do is go back and look at the last few years of CBO projections. They're const they, like everybody else, are constantly revising their downward, their forecasts for unemployment, or rather upward, uh, their uh, forecasts for unemployment, and downward their forecasts for GDP growth. Um, I'm with Larry on this. I don't see a, a, a fast recovery coming out of this. Um, my own view is that uh, many, many years ago I took a very standard, uh, uh, what was then anyways, a very standard macroeconomic model and stuck a, uh, a zero uh, lower bound for, uh, for wage growth, that you couldn't actually cut nominal wages into that model. And when I did that, I found that instead of cycling back to equilibrium, uh, it just stopped when wages, wage growth stopped or became very, very low. And it just sat there. It did not go anywhere without some sort of push uh, from the government. And uh, that could either be monetary or fiscal policy, but uh, in the case of, uh, 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 as, as Larry says right now, uh, uh, the big guns anyways that the Fed has are, are played out. They've, they've shot every bullet in that gun. Um, I have, I have also, I've actually written an article recently for the New Republic, uh, if you Google Dickens and New Republic, you'll see I, I wrote on what the options the Fed faces right now are. Uh, nominal GDP targeting is probably my favorite idea for what they should be doing right now, in addition to um, uh, getting rid of the interest paid on, on uh, deposits at the Fed, uh, reserve deposits at the Fed. In fact, I'd even go a little further and say they might even try uh, charging banks for depositing reserves in order to uh, uh, increase the, the likelihood that banks will do some more lending and stimulate output growth. But I frankly do not believe that the Fed can get us out of this recession. I think that the only way we can get out of this recession is fiscal policy. So there Bruce and I disagree. Uh, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't, I'm not a big, I don't think the Fed can do anything. Oh no no, but I, I that's no I understand that, but you don't seem to think fiscal policy could do anything either. No no, I think that unless you fix the deficit, it's going to be trade very deficit. aggressive. It's going to be a very aggressive fiscal policy. Um, well, I think we're agreed then because I think a very aggressive fiscal policy would be required, but I don't think we're in a structural slump either. I guess that's the main thing. I think that if the pump priming would be good enough to get us back, I'm, I'm we disagree. We disagree on that and. Um, it's not so much that we disagree, I just don't, I, well, at this point I'm only going on, on my gut feeling from having worked with these sorts of models, the structural sum sort of models. I, I want to see it. I want to see your paper uh, on this. When's that coming? 
what a version of it is coming in. Okay. Right. Bruce, let me ask you to respond to uh, Larry's arguments. You, okay. You're you dismissal, dismissive of monetary policy, okay. and Larry let believes. Let me agree with what I can agree with, and then I'll deal with what I think Larry is just as bad as the confidence given people. Uh, <laughs> the first thing is that in these recessions, it looks like, and in most of the respectable models, there is a shock that occurs. It's very hard to tell whether shocks are financial or non-financial. The reason is that clearly financial markets react first, because that's where things can change really rapidly. But whether they're anticipating shortfalls in demand at companies, rises in commodity prices, are almost impossible to separate. I mean, we've looked at it very carefully for the Depression. We've looked at it very carefully for other recessions. It's very hard to see in futures markets actions that are different from the financial effects and that the financial effects typically are in many cases long delayed. But let's talk about the evidence that monetary policy matters. One, monetary policy works through interest rates. Larry is ignoring an enormous mass of evidence that interest rates don't affect micro decisions. He no. somehow thinks, oh no, that's Bill. Housing, no. I, I, housing and, and consumer durables, there's plenty of evidence that, that interest rate affects that. You don't think that lowering the nominal interest okay, rates reduces the amount, uh, doesn't uh, that's the, the That's the most excited I've ever seen Bill Dickens get. Yeah. Not I agree, but that's money. not... Okay, that's let, let... Okay, so I, housing investment, the, the effects are much smaller, I think, than you're pretending, and there are other reasons why they can occur. Remember, Bill, if you look at monetary policy before the 1980s, which is when most of these housing effects of uh, interest rates occur, you've got other channels of monetary policy. That's why his 1994 article is a waste of time, because it's 1992 data, it's all in the period, the only recession there is 1991-92. I think we were both advising the Board of Governors at the time, and they were shocked at the slowness of the recovery from 1991-92 given monetary policy. So you've got to, if you're going to talk about monetary <coughs> policy, you've got to look at the much more recent data. Okay, but I think the micro evidence is very weak on interest rate effects per se, especially real interest rate effects. Because in the 80s, when this recovery occurs, real interest rates are extraordinarily high. Because prices go, inflation goes down much more rapidly than interest rates go down. And that's a big problem. But the second issue is with this whole business of the zero lower bound. Rates of inflation were the same or lower in the 50s and 60s, early 60s, than they are today. That rates of inflation have, in historical periods been low to flat, and somehow the zero lower bound doesn't become a problem. All of a sudden, recently, starting really in 1980 with Japan, the, the zero lower bound gets to be a big problem. Now, Japan was, I'm sorry, in the early 1990s, Japan was classically a manufacturing economy. That the US manufacturing sector is basically destroyed in the 1980s recession. Japan was going to rule the world in a sector, and so I think it's very hard to separate the structural effects from these zero lower bound effects. Secondly, about the zero lower bound, movements in interest rates, real interest rates in this incident, are much larger than the ones that have historically moved the economy off the situation where it was in trouble. We went from about five to six to zero. That inflation stayed, actually it probably accelerated a little bit. You had a 7% move in interest rates. We've never seen anything like that in these incidents where monetary policy actually affected things. So I think the zero lower bound is when they have nothing else to say. Somebody in the models have a zero lower bound, and they say, ah, oh, it's a zero lower bound. Bruce just Third, I, I, that I'll be finished. When you look at the Asia crisis, which is a really good laboratory for severe recessions, the people who try and recover through traditional monetary policy, as opposed to manipulating their currencies and supporting international trade, and direct recapitalization of the banks, and that is Korea and Malaysia, recover much faster 
than the people who rely on traditional monetary policy. I think the evidence has to be, and by the way, even in the old days, there were countries where the evidence was monetary policy didn't work. Uh, the St. Louis Fed, and those seem to be countries without these limits on demand. So I think the evidence is monetary policy just absent the seniorage effect that used to exist does not work. So, Larry, you might want to respond to that a little bit. And I'd love you to ask Till uh, and make some comments about Till's long-term questions. Uh, and, and maybe have a little discussion with him about the long-term consequences of uh, wage deterioration. Okay, well, I mean, it would, we could, uh, Bruce and I could argue for many hours. I mean, my, my views about uh, the effects of monetary policy are largely derivative of the, the various works of Romer and Romer. Uh, who have, um, I, I think they first of all persuasively argued that a lot of the econometric studies, the effects of monetary policy are completely unpersuasive because they're not identified. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, if you regress investment on, on interest rates, you don't know whether it's uh, demand or supply driving things. You, uh, anyway, they, um, uh, I think Rumor and Rumor primarily have looked very carefully at the history of, of the U.S., and this has been replicated for other countries, and uh, found, first of all, that um, we can account for uh, most of the uh, recessions uh, through tightenings of monetary policy, um, and uh, most of the recoveries through uh, expansions of monetary policy. Actually, I shouldn't give Romer Romer too much credit. That, that was Friedman and Schwartz. That was their big idea. And, and I think um, uh, while uh, econometric evidence uh, about various interest rate effects is is murky, uh, and our understanding of the channels of monetary policy is not complete. Uh, the people who have looked at it carefully, looked at the historical record carefully, that it's really pretty uh, pretty clear. Um, I mean, as far as um, the zero balance is a lame excuse because we've uh, lowered interest rates six points and we still haven't recovered. Um, I I think that's the same fallacy as people who say, well. We, we've learned that fiscal stimulus is a stupid idea because look, Obama did a fiscal stimulus and, uh, and, and the economy didn't recover or the economy got worse. Uh, I mean, I think Obama did a fiscal sti it's stimulus and uh, it wasn't big enough to, to um, uh, uh, do the whole job, but things would have been even worse um, if, if they hadn't done the stimulus. Um, things would be even worse if, if interest rates had stayed at 4% instead of going down to zero. But um, I don't know. We obviously, we have a fundamental difference on reading the literature about about that. Um, uh, what else? Um, could you could you address some of Till's comments? Because you got you guys work in the same general area. So. Well, I, don't know. I mean, I actually, I mean, Till's thing was was, was really um, a, a, a downer, like this whole panel. Actually, I mean, just to, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, actually, just to amplify, I mean, I mean, you know, Till finds these really big effects you know, on, on earnings, your children's earnings, divorce, and so on. And, and again, remember, that's from past uh, recessions, um, which, uh, and, and which did not have a long-term unemployment. What was, what, what was the share of long-term unemployment in the, in the 80s, do you know? Yeah, I, it's, it's one of my last slides, yeah. but it's much lower. Can much you lower, grab the mic, uh, Tell? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's significantly lower than this recession. Yeah, it's yeah, so, no so, so, so the, the, the unemployment rate is actually not quite as high as the, the peak in the early 80s, but it's that, that almost half of the unemployed are, uh, have been unemployed more than 26 weeks. And, and, and that's, yeah, several times as large as uh, the past. So I think the, presum the presumption is that, you know, if, if Till redoes the study you know, 20 years from now using the data from this recession, it's going to be uh, just that much more uh, gruesome. Yeah, can I say it's much worse than Till is pretending to be. If you look at participation rates, in, a, in good times, it's sort of 67% of the 16 to 65-year-old population. At the moment, it's 63.5. All those people are the dis disabled people who have just given up. There are housewives who decided they don't want, who weren't housewives who decided, but with no jobs available, that's what they're going to do. There are people in school. If you take a full employment participation rate and measure unemployment from that level, the current unemployment rate is over 13%. It hasn't gone down at all. So it doesn't peak at 10 and go down. It goes straight up through 12 and a half to about 13 
and it's just fluctuated around there. So it is much worse, especially in long-term unemployment, Le given the way. Let me add to that. I mean, sort of the underemployment rates so hover around 16, 70 percent. Right, so you, so you could think of 20 percent of overall underemployment isn't isn't a bad estimate. So our estimates of, of the earnings losses account for people who drop out, right? So that that's certainly integrated. But it's very true that a larger recession, and we have done these estimates in a recent Brookings paper that, that was just presented in September. The earnings losses always go up in recessions, and so the larger the recession the larger is the earnings loss going to be and the more long lasting. So if you extrapolate this for this recession, we're, we're in deep trouble from that end. I want to point out, since sort of this is sort of a macro-based panel, there's a nice paper by uh, Okun uh, in 1973 in the Brookings papers. And uh, he says, well, my law, Okun's law, what, didn't quite get it right because you we have to take into account that a good economy pushes a bunch of workers into good jobs and they're going to accumulate skills. So the, the, the title is the, the benefits of a high-pressure economy. Right. Uh, upward mobility in a high-pressure economy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just, uh, trying, uh, I was just trying to look it up. And then yeah. I, I, I so it's the benefit of a classic. So, yeah. yeah, it's a classic. Well, not quite. I mean, Yager, La and, and uh, Rosedale. Well, but the thing is, there, I think the, the, the negative, the, so we need to connect sort of my estimates of the micro level back to the macro level. We need to redo that and say, well, if you're a century bill, you essentially have that in your model. Right? How much is lost from the fact that these workers are going to be sort of milling around and not being in good jobs where they accumulate any skill? And you can take any of these paths, say for young workers entering the labor market, and call that the lack, some, some measure of the lack of productivity because of the recession. And you could feed that into your model. Let me uh, ask the audience to participate. I actually see a uh, somewhat more optimistic silver lining in all this because all three, all four people are talking about some kind of stimulus that could work and may be an otherworldly stimulus or on another planet, but uh, it didn't seem to me to be all despair. And in fact, there is something of a Keynesian moment on our panel, much like there was a Keynesian moment for about five minutes in 2008. And now we're back to wherever we are. But questions, please. David. Uh, I'm going to have to repeat questions because uh, I should have told the audience we are both taping this and video streaming it, and we don't have mics for you. But okay. try to keep your questions short. Uh, I'm not going to be. I have nothing optimistic to say about this, but I do just a point of information about uh, long-term unemployment. In 1983, it's about 23 percent, and in uh, in the current situation, it's like 46, certainly above 40 percent. And it was Robert Barrow who, in the August Wall Street Journal, argued that that difference can be explained entirely by uh, extensions. And I think Till has done some work on that and for <coughs> Zogu and So um, the question is that a long-term unemployment rate has risen to above 40 percent from 23 percent or so in the second worst recession of the post-World War II period. And Barrow explains it yeah. by extensions. Did you want to comment on that, Tim? Sure. Um, so actually, we, I have a paper where we show that the increases in unemployment insurance durations are very unlikely to explain increases in unemployment durations in recessions. Um, and that's sort of more recent evidence actually in Brookings by Jesse Rothstein come to the same conclusion. I spoke to Barrow about this when I gave a seminar at Harvard and we had a meeting and I said, what about your numbers in the Wall Street Journal? And he said, oh, they were just sort of meant to stoke debate a little. <laughs> uh, and they certainly did, right? But I think sort of if you actually now, now we do the math and get the, the, the data right, that, that, that cannot be explained by unemployment. Well, did Barrow, ba you know, I don't take this kind of thing lightly because it seems to be endemic to the Wall Street Journal op-ed. I read papers by well-known Stanford professors. I just can't believe some of the things they say. Uh, I assume to stoke arguments. So did Barrow take it back when he said, well, I, those, he just threw those numbers in? Um, that will be too much to say. <laughs> but we had a good discussion. <laughs> OK, let us know if he takes it back. Other questions? Ed. <coughs> One comment is that starting with Hall and Hitch in the 1930s and the discussion in the American Economic Review in the 1940s and through the continued work of Lawrence Klein, uh, who did a lot of or made use of a lot of interview data, the effect of interest rates on the economy was largely 
thought to be confined to the housing and construction se sector. And in particular, nothing like the marginal efficiency of capital calculation ever took place. Um, so this is just one comment. And the second comment is that in recent times, the structure of the financial market does not seem to move together, whereas, as Bruce pointed out earlier, it did. But now you have a lot of effects on spreads and term structure, which means that the interest rate impact on different parts of the economy is significantly different. And the real impact is perhaps even more different. But I wanted to raise the question of new sectors, because the long-term effect might very well depend on the fact that new sectors are coming in that could create productivity and employment. But the question is, when you look for those, you find the new sectors, but you don't find much of an employment effect. You mean to say that new, new sectors are not creating jobs? Do, do people do? do this is a question for the panel. What yeah. about this enormous field of biotech, which links into healthcare? Um, is this going to be an area that will generate new jobs, new productivity, new products, and the like? Well, or I, I, I can give, I think, two answers to that. If you look at the structure of, uh, of jobs and the trends in the structure of jobs, that in a sense it already has. I mean, the biggest category of jobs in the U.S. economy by far today is managerial profession. So the people who are doing the research, whether it's in the companies or at the universities, are already there, and that's an enormous advantage, by the way, for the United States. But in terms of manufacturing jobs, in terms of jobs for non-college graduates, even non-degree people, Bruce, can you oh, sorry, the, the effect is going to be zero, because these are factories where there's nobody in them. I mean, I would urge you all to visit a factory if you want to see what's going on. There are more people on the loading docks moving stuff than there are in the factories themselves making. So I think the answer is that if they're manufacturing related, not service related, not in hospitals using those therapies, not thinking up those therapies, the job effects are going to be zero. Any other comments on job effects of new technologies or even recent technologies, not brand new technologies? No other questions on that? Yes. I wanted to thank you for your presentations and the honesty rather than so much of the part of the U.S. we get from Washington. And uh, I think you did bring up, uh, with the technology we have in globalism, it was supposed to raise all shit. If it's not doing it, well, the jobs. <laughs> and jobs, yeah, exactly. Jobs, income, wealth, better standard of living, sustainable quality of life. And if it's not doing it, we have to go back to, to look at our assumptions. I think that the... Uh, Global trade is a huge issue that we need to develop better strategies since the old ones aren't working, not only nationally, but transnationally, which is something that FDR, to be a little more hopeful and optimistic, uh, was at least willing enough to look at the problems and say that the, uh, the former League of Nations and uh, national orientations, even at that time, were not. So let, let me try to boil down your question. Are you, are you asking whether? Well, said I, what I think you were asking was where we sold a bill of goods with globalization. Uh, uh, well, I didn't. Let me see if anybody would care to jump in on that. I think as far as unemployment is concerned, that globalization and technological change are, are, are secondary issues. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, going back to the Luddites, you know, people are worried about how technologies are going to, um, uh, are, are going to affect jobs. You know, we can worry now, what will people do if they, don't, if they don't have manufacturing, which used to be X percent of the economy. We think we could go back 100 or 200 years and say, oh, what if employment in agriculture goes down to 3%? When will, where, where will people work then? Uh, I, I think these things, I mean, there, there are, the market economy does work nicely uh, under some conditions that, you know, what kinds of jobs there are adapt to technology. 
to the extent you know uh, technological change leads to productivity growth. Uh, th there are some changes in labor share, but by and large, uh, pro uh, the growth of wages is closely tied to productivity growth. Um, to the extent there's any relationship to unemployment, uh, I'd say the evidence, say from the 90s, suggests that uh, an, an upsurge of productivity growth is good for reducing unemployment. Uh, the, the trick is just that you you, you need to have Keynes's basic insight that you, you need to have enough aggregate demand so that um, you know people can buy the things, so the firms can sell the things, so the firms can hire the workers, and uh, that's what's broken. You know, we, we could, you know, five years ago we could have had the same discussion about. You know, uh, is globalization good or bad, or uh, you know, is bio what bi what's biotech going to do? You know, what what's happened since then is going to collapse in demand. Any other comment? Any other comment about that particular issue? Uh, Till. Well, just a quick. Do, do, in that process, though, that, that Larry described, there's a bit of a question of what happens to the income distribution. So what has happened over the 20, 30 years? There's been sort of uh, a somewhat of a hollowing out of the income distribution. So there were people employed in certain manufacturing jobs that absent those jobs can get only lower skilled service jobs. And the question is, well, once manufacturing is gone, will we just live forever with an income distribution where th that is just a bifurcated, right? Or will we actually see a trend where these workers are then utilizing others with more high paying jobs? So as part of this evolution, we will see sort of trends in, in, in income that you know, will, will shape our society. It seems. The, the question was, should we be actively shaping them or not? And I guess that's a uh, Bill and Bruce, any final comments on that particular issue? Yeah. It <laughs> I mostly agree with Larry. Um, I uh, just a couple of, of of qualifications and thoughts. I I don't think that the income distribution story is as simple as saying that well, technological train trade and chain and technological tra change and trade have so far widened the income gap and favored the, the well-educated over the less well-educated and, and favored the, the people who were involved in, in finance and things that, that moved capital around around the globe to... Uh, uh, I don't think that that, that necessarily... <coughs> that's certainly been the story in the past. I don't think it necessarily holds in the future. You've got a, if you have a bunch of, of people who are uh, less skilled and, uh, and they're not making very good wages, somebody's going to say, hey, well, these are less skilled workers that are, if we can find ways of using technology to employ those people, uh, we can save money. And that then starts bidding up the wages of, of low skilled workers. Similarly, if highly educated workers have suddenly run their wages way up, People are going to go, how can we conserve on highly educated workers? Let's get expert systems. Uh, let's uh, make more use of, uh, of, 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 of systems where, where we do distance learning and things like that to, to spread out the, uh, to make our, our brain power, our highly educated workers do more work uh, in cooperation with other people. Those are the sorts of things that, that can happen and change the way that the Changes are changing the income distribution. The other thing is on the demand or on the supply side, um, we are already seeing that the sons and daughters of people who used to work in manufacturing firms with a high school education are going to community college and and getting degrees that uh, allow them to work as technicians uh, in in healthcare and uh, in other service industries and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so that's another way in which the economy adapts. And, and so but there's a lot of uh, faith in the market there, uh, Bill. I, you know, Walmart learned how to use low-skill, low wor low-wage workers, and wages didn't increase until there was a minimum wage increase imposed oh, oh. by the federal government. Okay, the usual, the usual argument, yes, we need, to, we need to do something about maintaining the minimum wage, and yes, the decline of the union sector has, has been played a, a, a good a major role in the decline in the increasing income uh, disparities and obviously institutional changes that would that would make worker bargaining power stronger would also help. Well, let me give Bruce the final word because we've actually run out of time. Okay. So I, briefly, I Bruce. The, the big problem with the way people are thinking about this whole thing is, and it's I think illustrated by Larry's last remark. 
which is that there is this thing called macro demand fluctuations, which really fluctuates and never has long-term problems. And then there are these underlying micro conditions that Bill uh, and Tiller are talking about, and they have these long-run effects. I think in general that's a reasonable separation, but there are these long periods where for specific major changes you cannot separate the two. And when you've got a sector that's dying and for informational reasons you can't finance the movement of those people and countries can't protect themselves by grabbing a bigger share of the dying market, you have a global demand problem that is structural. Globalization is fine, and we love Chinese goods if there's not a global oversupply of goods. But when there's a global oversupply of goods and global unemployment, and the Chinese are relentlessly trying to expand their share of demand, you're going to be in real long-term trouble. And it's not traditional macro trouble. On that characteristically upbeat note, <laughs> uh, we really appreciate your, the audience coming. We very much appreciate the panelists uh, going out of the way to uh, make, I think, what was an unusually interesting set of presentations. Larry, Bruce, Bill, Till, thanks very much. Thank you all again. <laughs>